I'm Phyllis Blumberg, and some of us are from various different organizations, and I think this is an absolutely wonderful opportunity for people of like-minded um, goals and like-minded persuasions to get together. I've been working with uh, volunteering with uh, Jewish Earth Alliance for the past year and a half. It's a great model. Ed is one of my mentors from the Jewish Earth Alliance. Um, and we'll talk about the model, but it's basically advocacy through letter writing and establishing a relationship with your elected representatives and then meeting with them when you can, either virtually or in person. And meeting with their staff is also important. I've also been active with in less time with the Pennsylvania Interfaith Power and Light. And I've really been enjoying all my interactions with them. And when I was volunteered to take on uh, coordinating a Pennsylvania effort to uh, get more people to write letters for to our congressmen people every month, I reached out to IPL, Interfaith Power and Light, and they loved the idea and thought this would be an absolutely wonderful way for them to do more advocacy and more building of uh, coalitions. So that's why we're starting this. This is the first time we're doing this. And hopefully we will continue on a regular basis to meet, to talk about how we can be more effective advocates. Um, so if everybody would please introduce themselves in the in the chat, just say who you, what your name is, where you're from. And if you're part of any one of these organizations or a different organization, that's fine. Um, and in a minute or so, we will get started with our inspirational message. Um, many organizations that are faith-based start with a prayer or an inspirational message. And I just thought we could do the same. So um, our inspirational message today comes from Rabbi Nathan Martin, who I have known actually my very first time that I met Rabbi Martin was when we were meeting with either Senator Toomey or Senator Casey's aide a couple of years ago. Um, and I've read about his, his great work in terms of sustainability. He not only walks the talk, he talks, he not only talks the talk, he walks the talks, he cycles the talk and he backpacks the talk. So he's a true environmentalist. So um, I'll turn it over to you, Rabbi Nathan, to um, give us a word or two, as they say in Hebrew, a devar. Great. Terrific. Thank you so much, Phyllis. And nice to also have my colleague uh, Amani here from um, PAIPL. She's our policy, uh, um, works in our policy and advocacy uh, area. So Amani, grateful to have you here as well. Um, so um, I wanted to kind of share a bit and situate us um, where at least um, the Jews are in our Torah cycle um, at this moment in time. And as we cycle through the five books of the Torah, the Pentateuch, um, every year, but we are um, in an interesting moment uh, because we are at the place where uh, Moses is giving his final words, um, which he goes on for a while, 20 plus chapters, uh, before the Israelites cross over um, into the land of Canaan. And there is really a kind of fierce urgency to, to, to the language. There's a mix of exhortation and condemnation. There's sort of a carrot and a stick um, to try and um, get this sort of crazy mixed multitude to not only stay the course, but how do they change their behavior to live rightly and to live justly. And um, it feels like you can hear the echoes of that speech given on that east bank of the Jordan River um, speak to us in some ways at the moment we are facing today, because we are really uh, as I'm becoming aware, and as all of you are on this call, uh, really at a kind of crossroads. We're facing an unknown future on the other side of the bank of this river. And um, the, the words in Deuteronomy are fairly clear that if we live in alignment um, with our core values, that uh, the Deuteronomic theology says we'll have enough resource to experience abundance. Um, but if we don't, the land will dry up. To me, that feels like a message around uh, climate change as well, because we also, uh, like our ancestors, um, we we want to both align ourselves to our core values. Um, we want to sort of live within a, a framework that will not only uh, allow us to flourish, but really to change consciousness 
um, in our communities and communities around the world. What, what we are facing as we get ready to cross into our to this future is we want to try and create and cement new attitudes um, that will uh, change the way we live and behave and consume fuel and carbon and um, energy for, for the future and for years to come. Uh, this uh, is um, for the, it was not an easy crossing. It was, you know, at least according to the biblical scholars, not according to the narrative in Joshua, but according to the biblical scholars, it was a very messy transformation as they crossed over, um, sort of a, you know, it did, it did not go smoothly. Um, and so I think that's one piece that we can learn that as we work on this, moving to a new, hopefully really uh, clean energy, um, just uh, transition um, into the future, it's going to be messy um, like it was back then. Uh, but the other piece that I want to take away, and I'll leave us with this before we um, head into our, our main speaker tonight, um, is that uh, the the piece that uh, I also take away from, from our tradition is that the Deuteronomist doesn't just exhort people to um, try and change, try and live a better life. Um, the Deuteronomist exhorts people to sort of take on very concrete steps um, as to what it means to live a better life. And in, in the biblical framework, that is treat the poor justly, you know, give, give food from the corners of your field, um, develop a, a spiritual grounding. You know, we could, we could lay out lots and lots of those pieces, but I think there's a, a, a lesson to be learned here as well, that as we learn about advocacy tonight, um, I, I invite us to think that about that as one piece that we integrate um, into our daily lives, along with all other types of practice, um, both the practice of um, doing concrete actions each day on behalf of the climate, um, as well as um, whatever personal spiritual work that allows us to cultivate a sense of resilience, um, that, that we need to sort of buoy ourselves and nourish ourselves with as we cross into um, the many years of, of transition that we face ahead. Um, so uh, may we take a little, um, a little energy from the words of this uh, long speech of Moses to gird ourselves for the future, but to know that uh, we are not alone in that work, that, that we are doing that this as many multiple encircled communities, um, and that we strengthen each other along the path. Thank you, Rabbi Nathan. Could not, nobody could have said it any better that we should all be doing concrete actions every day. And now we're going to be hearing about concrete actions and to be have resilience for the future because it is going to be long and messy. And we need to have patience as we go through this process. So thank you so much for these words. And now I'd like to um, introduce Roger Stevenson. He's the Northeast Director uh, for Advocacy for the Union of Concerned Scientists. And this is a quote from him. He believes that he can uh, point to, that everybody, each of us can point to something that motivates us to take action. And Roger's motivations are wildlife and his grandchildren. If you don't know anything about the Union of Concerned Scientists, they were started in the 70s um, by Massachusetts, MIT scientists. Um, in order to fight the causes that they thought were extremely important to help save the world. And they put rigorous independent science to work to solve our planet's most pressing problems. And one of them that they're combating in a big time is combating climate change. They seek to <clears throat> alleviate harm by causing by the cause that by, by the way, what's been caused by heat, sea level rise and other consequences of runaway emissions. So um, I would be very, I'm thrilled that we were able to have Roger come and speak to us tonight. And I am sure he's going to give us lots of good messages. So take it away, Roger, thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. And um, bear with me, I, I did go to the College of Low Technology uh, and I will share my screen uh, and we'll get started. <clears throat> Here we are. Can 
you all see the screen? Phyllis? We're, we're seeing your PowerPoint notes. And, and the notes? Yeah. Yeah. You okay. might, if you you might want to go into, into uh, yeah. Presentation mode? Uh, presentation mode. Yeah. A uh, quick suggestion, if you go up to the second option, display settings, and click on the other option. OK. You mean in share screen? Oh, thank you so much. That's better. Very good. Great. Go. Thank you. See if you can find any. My um, pleasure. I don't want to go into <clears throat> And very good. Thank you for your uh, help, Amani. Uh, so thank you, uh, Phyllis, and thank you for your work with the Union of Concerned Scientists uh, last month. Um, I want to thank the Pennsylvania Jewish Earth Alliance, and thank you to uh, Rabbi for your remarks. I um, wrote down that uh, you suggested that we have to gird ourselves for the future. I think we all have also have to gird ourselves for this coming fall. Um, and thank you for uh, introducing the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, my um, work with the Union of Concerned Scientists uh, has been uh, about for about eight years, um, and I there I I have uh, there's no greater pleasure for me than to bring our advocates and our scientists and our science champions into uh, the room of a lawmaker uh, and sort of pull that string in between their shoulder blades and let them go to work. Um, uh, they're our strongest advocates. Uh, and our staff includes scientists, engineers, economists, and analysts. And um, to address some of today's most pressing problems, uh, we augment our in-home resources with our ability to mobilize some of the nation's top scientists, uh, our uh, half million or so members and supporters. And we have a unique asset called our U UCS Science Network, some 20,000 scientists and technical experts, uh, medical researchers, public health professionals, uh, doctors, uh, academics, et cetera, uh, across the country to take action. Um, tonight, we're going to uh, cover these, these, the following things, uh, sharing your story and what motivates you and where we stand on infrastructure and climate, and why advocacy matters. And I may be, uh, um, I, I have a feeling I'm talking to a, a, a group of leaders here, and I hope what I have to share will help you and motivate you uh, and bring others into your circles. Uh, why does advocacy matter? We sort of understand that. I want to show some, uh, share some pragmatic reasons why, as well as some tips and tricks. So what motivates you? Why are you here with me, a stranger, at 7.30 in the evening on another Zoom after 16 months of learning how to use these technologies? What motivates you? Think about that. What is it? Because that motivation is going to be an important part of the stories you tell and the narratives you contribute as you advocate for climate action. Um, this motivates me. Um, I, um, I've been entranced with the natural world since I was a boy. I was outside all the time. I was sharing with Phyllis and uh, Rabbi Martin that uh, our, our mutual love of Harriman State Park. Um, I was a conservation counselor at Boy Scout camp. Um, occasionally, I, I would race to save a timber rattlesnake from being killed by others who felt that they needed to kill the rattlesnake to protect uh, the Boy Scouts. Instead, I caught and uh, released those rattlesnakes. Um, my master's research combined my love of the outdoors with uh, my love of birds because uh, my research had me camped for weeks in one of the remotest sections of White Mountain National Forest in an area that had never been logged. I've banded birds. Uh, I'm a bird watcher. And this is one of my favorite birds, the black-throated blue warbler. Um, 
if you have a couple of coins in your pocket, a couple of quarters, take them out. That's how, about how much a black throated blue warbler weighs. Uh, I'm delighted to, to say that, that we can find this bird breeding in Pennsylvania and in New Hampshire, um, special habitats. It's not our bird at all. Um, he goes, common sense takes over and he goes to, to uh, Jamaica and Cuba for the winter. Uh, for So about seven months of the year, he's not in this, on this continent. But a bird this size travels year after year for six, seven years uh, during its uh, life cycle uh, back and forth uh, to create other black-throated blue warblers. I promised Phyllis that I <coughs> contribute <coughs> excuse me, the ABCs of the infrastructure bill. Well, um, it's pretty simple. Uh, airports are gonna be happy, bridges are gonna be happy, climate, not so much. That's where we are right now. It's a 2,700 page infrastructure bill at the moment. Um, we're together tonight in a defining moment. Again, as uh, Rabbi Martin said, um, there's some good, uh, the, the by there's some bad, uh, and there's not nearly enough for climate. The bipartisan infrastructure bill may be passed as early as Sunday, but definitely next week. We need to remember that the bipartisan infrastructure bill is not a climate bill. It was never intended to be a climate bill. Um, there are a few bright spots, including funding for PFAS, uh, forever chemicals. Um, but as for climate, it does not meet the moment. It does not address energy and climate, the level called for in the American Jobs Plan. We're living in a climate crisis, and Congress must ensure that bold and necessary climate solutions are an integral part of legislation that passes this year. This is our fall. Our health, economy, and future depend on it. We don't have any time to waste. Uh, legislation enacted this year, either as part of the bipartisan infrastructure package or the reconciliation package, um, uh, must include a significant down payment on our climate action, on climate action that guarantees robust uh, reductions in heat trapping emissions, uh, investments in making our communities and infrastructure more climate resilient. So, Here's what Congress must do, and I will put this, this link into the chat for you to, to uh, copy. Um, this is all explained in detail by colleagues from the Union of Concerned Scientists. These are the four things that Congress has got to do. Clean up the power sector, electrify our transportation sector, help prepare and protect communities dealing with climate change, and build a resilient and equitable food and farm system. Um, that's what Congress can do. Um, and it's, it's politics. Uh, so the politicians have the balls and it can be a rough sport, uh, especially these days when more often than not, ideology trumps policy. But I wanna assure you uh, and, and everyone, and you should assure uh, all of your friends and neighbors that citizenship and civic engagement and politics are all rooted in citizens. And this slide is in homage to my daughter who was a classics major and I promised that I would take her advice and drop it in. Um, so let's discuss civic engagement. What's advocacy? Well, why is it important? Uh, I look at advocacy as, as being about taking action to defend or support an issue uh, with a specific target in mind. And you need to know what your demand is. It needs to be specific and measurable. Um, because you, you gotta be able to find out if, if it happened. Without a demand, it's hard to convince anyone that you have any serious ideas about what needs to change. You have to have a target. Without a target, it's hard to figure out who to act, and uh, I know Seth is on this call, and I'm and I'm looking forward to hearing from you and others who you who your targets will be in the coming weeks. Um, there are a number of paths for advocacy. 
uh, providing support to community groups, educating legislators on the science behind critical issues, uh, elevating science through the media, serving as a resource on a state board, a local advisory board, serving as a resource to the staff or the member of Congress. Uh, many times, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, often helpful to send a nice to know email to a staffer. Uh, uh, not with an ask, but uh, I hope this is helpful. And we'll get into that in a moment. Um, now, I wanna say a few words about your audience, uh, the elected leaders in Congress. Um, I have been involved in political campaigns over many years, uh, not with the Union of Concerned Scientists, but in previous work. And in a vacuum, Three things help shape how many politicians, not all, but many politicians decide on an issue. Three things help shape how politicians make decisions on issues and what positions they take and whether they will lead their lawmaking peers to make a law. Ink is one, you know, favorable media, editorials, uh, tweets, uh, local stories involving issues that they care about. Money. Uh, Ever, ever more so uh, since uh, the Citizens United ruling. And votes, you know, at the end of election day, the bottom line is, uh, did I get the 50% of the votes plus one to get reelected? And that's in a vacuum. Um, fortunately, advocacy can fill that vacuum and oftentimes very effective. Um, I want to turn to a, a politician's point of view for just a moment, how we, because how we fill the vacuum is important. Uh, so allow me to set the stage. A pragmatic yet bold political consultant shared with me a number of years ago how politicians view environmentalists. Uh, our message is seen as always a science one. We're generally talking about things like EM 2.5 and habitats. And we're always giving the opponents a shot in the mouth. Our crowd is seen as divided, unreasonable, difficult to deal with, always raising the bar, impossible to satisfy. Now, I'm not saying that science is not important. Uh, I'm not saying that this is right all of the time or how we are viewed is correct. But, you know, uh, we have to put ourselves in the shoes of an elected official. Um, and this is a typical exchange between legislators and environmentalists. This is where it's built upon. And it, when we, if we start where they are and not where we are at the particular moment. When we say to a legislator, we'd like to support you, here's what we expect. Oftentimes we will get, I can't do all that, here's what I can do. That's because decisions and points of view of legislators are very likely their own, but can be greatly influenced from the outside. Politicians bring a point of view. They decide often based on values, beliefs, and relationships. They do not decide based on facts and information. They're more likely to do things for people they know and trust. This is why you are so important because my colleagues can do the, all of the research they want and publish all of the reports they can, and they won't get out the door and make a difference without the relationships that you bring to the table. So as activists, we must, if we're to succeed, remember to start at the point where legislators are coming from. Um, Politicians are people too. Um, there's a couplet that um, a mentor of mine uh, repeated almost daily, and I use it all the time. And that advice was people want to be involved, not told. They want to be served, not sold. Politicians are the same way. So as we Proceed and develop relationships. Always be prepared to recognize a positive action in public. Thank them for something they've done. 
and then pivot to your ne next ask. You know, for example, uh, thank you, Senator Collins, for leading on battery storage research. Uh, the terrific leadership, we really appreciate it. And we need you to support tax credits for battery storage in order to bring the technology and that research to market. And away from the cameras, the crowds, and print media, and private, be prepared to explain why a vote does a disservice to people and your community and your, your jobs and your district. Craft a message that makes clear what's at stake for the target. Uh, while data is important to add understanding and credibility, we also need to ground the overall framing by serving up stories. Uh, so that the people can connect with personally. Here is something I, I wanted to share this with you because um, Senator Mike Enzi will be remembered in a memorial service on Friday. Uh, it will be a day that um, Congress will adjourn uh, and uh, pay respects to the Senator who died uh, unexpectedly uh, last month. He said when he was leaving the Senate, nothing gets done when we're just telling each other how wrong we are. Just ask yourself, has anyone ever changed your opinion by getting in your face and yelling at you or saying to you how wrong you are? Usually that doesn't change hearts or minds. So we've talked about advocacy and, and the, 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 the targets. Um, here is the target the decision maker. And uh, here is the Union of Concerned Scientists and our members and activists. Uh, here is the Jewish Earth Alliance and the Interfaith Power and Flight, our allies and, and stakeholders, you as uh, ratepayers, you as citizens of, of Pennsylvania. Uh, surrounding you is the issue public. That section, that segment of the public that pays attention to policy. And beyond them is the public at large. No one person or organization has the resources to connect with the entire issue public, but we can be effective in this outreach by connecting with opinion leaders. Close circle surrounding the target. And opinion leaders don't have to be elites. Opinion leaders, can, can get around, they, they, you know, they get around, they move in circles. Some get around by staying in one place. And one example for me um, is a barber. Years ago, uh, Maggie Hassan, my, my Senator, was running for state Senate. She was challenging uh, an opponent who was claiming that he was an environmental leader and he wasn't at all. And I was taking my lessons on opinion leaders uh, to the barber, uh, thinking that, well, you know, people are in that chair listening to him day after day after day. I'd like to talk to him about Maggie Hassett and say a few words. And lo and behold, uh, the barber, and the name of the shop was Jim's Barber Shop. Uh, when the talk came around to elections, uh, Jim did use some of the things that he heard from me uh, in talking to his, his, uh, his customers. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so he's seen as someone who has listened to the community. He's seen as an honest broker and he gets around talks to a lot of people, even by standing in one place. Are there examples of opinion leaders who get around to standing one, uh, by sitting in one place? Could be an executive assistant to a CEO. So think about who those, dis, those opinion leaders are, and we can talk more about that in a few minutes. Power mapping would help you understand your sphere of influence over a specific decision maker. A decision maker. Power mapping helps you think strategically about how to focus your advocacy efforts. Basically means doing some homework to understand the landscape, landscape around you. Um, 
and understand the relationships and pathways you may have to leverage to get access to the, and put the pressure on. Uh, you know, it's used by advocates to decide on the most strategic actions to ensure your messages and approaches are resident and relevant. And what really needs to change? Um, where is that change uh, being made today? You know, we know the change that we need to be made are in the halls of Congress. And who needs to make that change happen? Oftentimes, there are multiple possible decision makers. You've got uh, a large delegation in Pennsylvania. Uh, no doubt you have made some decisions on who those uh, points, uh, who those most important decision makers are. Communicating with decision makers means, you know, uh, educating legislators on a science, but also telling your story. Communicating with decision makers means talking to the staff. They are just as important and influential as talking to the members face to face. Organizing others, just as Phyllis has done uh, tonight. You know, one way to take your advocacy to the next level is to organize others who care about the same issues so you can work together to create policy change. Multiple voices from multiple corners so that when you're Congressman walks out the door, he or she can't face the day without hearing from a small business, a faith leader, uh, an environmental advocate, a mother, an educator about climate change. And many grassroots <clears throat> and environmental justice organizations that are fighting for public health and environmental, <clears throat> excuse me, those who are fighting for public health or environmental protections lack access, access to expertise. A scientist, UCS, can offer valuable support on both the scientific side of things, but also the policy side as well. But partnering with community groups Partnering with surprise partners. Um, years ago, I ran something called the Carbon Coalition to put uh, a climate change resolution on the warrant at town meeting in New Hampshire. Uh, local decisions are made once a year at town meeting. Citizens become the legislators. The uh, selectmen are the executive branch. And generally, the warrant articles are the town budget. Should there be a dog leash law? Should the administrator get a raise? Uh, how much do we give the library? Well, we decided to test this and put a climate change resolution on the warrant. And the advice I got from uh, a person who was very, very smart, he said, in your campaign, three things have to be true. You have to take the partisanship out of the issue of climate, but you have to embrace the politics of New Hampshire. And thirdly, you have to bring in surprise partners. And what can you bring to your table? What connections do you have? You know, one key to successful engagement is thinking about the assets you bring to the table and aligning them with where you can make an impact. <clears throat> everyone has assets, everyone has these qualities. Think about your connections. I, I introduced opinion leaders earlier uh, this evening. Again, they're not elites. Um, um, uh, and you know, a staff member to a member of Congress, it certainly can be considered as an opinion leader. What strengths and skills and knowledge do you bring? You know, if, if you have grandchildren like I do, and you have a history on this planet, a young staffer does not. Do you like to write? Are you a planner? Is faith, Facebook a favorite pastime? All of these can aid in your advocacy efforts. All of those are assets that you can bring to the table. And then what is your story? Most people don't remember data, they remember stories. So if you can bring it and build a narrative around what you care about in a particular issue, it's a foundational piece of building relationships. And building relationships is foundational to 
building trust and creating change in the minds of our decision makers. Uh, the last piece of your planning is the how, that is, how do we do this? Uh, Phyllis is retired and, and she's working more than full time on this issue. Um, how do we build more support to stay active, build strength and make this work sustainable? Well, embrace and lead with your strengths. Remember that no one can do it all. There are different levels of access and power for each person. There are very real barriers that exist in the system, at the system level because of racism or economic injustice. If you have privilege and access, think intentionally about you know, how you can share that with others and be comfortable sharing responsibility and involvement. And finally, um, celebrate the work you're doing. In addition to being strategic, playing to your strengths, allow yourself to step away, recharge, celebrate regardless of the outcome. Make sure to plan out times to enjoy the company of your partners and family for their efforts. And on this slide, I wanna call your attention to the website address at the bottom. Uh, the Science Network website address. Um, there are a number of tools that you can find there and I'll include links to some of those tools in the chat uh, as we begin our Q&A. And finally, on behalf of this little guy, um, I wanna thank you uh, for the privilege of speaking with you tonight, sharing with you some of my thoughts and experience. Um, I'd be happy to share some of my mistakes as well but we're being recorded and I don't want the world to learn all those mistakes, but I hope this has been helpful and I welcome your questions. And thank you, Phyllis. And again, thank you, Rabbi Martin, uh, for your leadership as well. And a mind for keeping everyone uh, on track with respect to policy. Thank you, Roger. That was fabulous. Each one of your slides, each one of your points could have become a presentation in itself, but it was a wonderful overview and I'm sure you motivated all of us and we do have a few minutes for questions. Anybody like to step forward and and have a ask a question just unmute yourself and speak. Roger, let me just jump in for a moment and just is there anything else you want to share about we're uh, how how the Union of Concerned Scientists is approaching the current political moment with the infrastructure bill or climate change policy in general, and where you're hoping to get the most leverage and change. Well, we do have to acknowledge there are some clean energy elements to the bipartisan infrastructure package. There aren't nearly as none. You know, three weeks ago, there was $15 billion for uh, EVs. Now there's seven and a half billion. Now, you know, there were compromises. Coming down, coming down. There's, I think there's $50 billion for climate resilience that ranges from wildfires to sea level rise. That, that isn't even a down payment. We have to acknowledge that there is some good in there that will help. But the reconciliation package is going to take this a step further and recognize the soft side of infrastructure. Um, there will need to be a clean energy standard um, at some point. If it's in reconciliation, it will have to be constructed in a way that survives the par parliamentary process. Um, but that's, you know, if we're going to meet the president's target, um, of reductions, a, the clean energy standard is the way to go. Now, um, we're gonna be working hard. Uh, I'm gonna post, I, I did just post uh, Rachel Cletus's blog post, the priorities for Congress and climate change. Those are the four elements that I showed early on in my slide deck. Um, and she and colleagues from our clean transportation program, our food and environment program, climate impact, and um, oh, uh, our Center for Science and Democracy all contributed to that, that post. So that, that is the full throw weight of the organization and what needs to happen. 
So we're looking very closely. You know, when Phyllis was on the um, on our lobby day, July 14th, things changed on a daily basis that so, so quickly that the op-ed my team in New Hampshire was writing was outdated every 24 hours. And I still haven't, we still haven't gotten that. But the other thing I wanna get across is we cannot afford to allow this Congress to continue the incrementalism, to continue nibbling at the edges. Uh, this is our fault. Thank you. Hi, Roger. Um, a few people in the chat wanted to know if you could go back to the resource page, which I believe is your last slide, just so they could get that information. Yeah, I'll, I will. Um, can I do that in chat at the same time, Amani? Yes. Uh, okay. What do you mean by that? Uh, I have no idea what I mean. Um, like if you go to your slides, you can probably yeah. just copy and paste all the information. But yeah, this works. Okay. Too. Sorry. That's my um, screen. The, I believe it's a slide before that. Okay. Let me get to that. Uh, okay, let's see if this does the trick. Okay, could you go back one more slide? I think it's the slide before that. Oh, this one right here? Yes, yeah. Thank you. Yep. You know, you can text science to 662266, as I have done, and I'm pleasantly surprised that I don't get bombarded with texts. And uh, the Science Network, I'm putting in the, in the chat right now, uh, several of those resources that are at the Science Network website, uh, including writing a letter to the editor and hosting a letter writing party, which was written pre-COVID. I'm afraid, but still people have had parties over Zoom, I'm told. And let's see, one more resource that I wanted to share with you. Oh, organizing a call-in campaign. We have an important uh, resource an asset on the call, and that's Seth Sachs. I wonder, Seth, if you have anything you might want to add. Thank you, Roger, I appreciate it. Hey, everybody, uh, Seth Sachs. Um, I'm re formerly with Climate Action New Hampshire, where I know Roger from, but I uh, recently started with Climate Action Pennsylvania. Uh, so it's really nice to meet everyone to be here. Um, not too much to add. I really liked your presentation. I really liked hearing about uh, you know, the differences between the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure deal and the reconciliation bill, which I'm pretty excited about. I did have a question for you, Roger, is are there any other um, pieces of climate legislation on the federal end that you find um, promising other than the reconciliation uh, bill that might be going through around the $3.5 trillion mark? Well, some of the standalone legislation that we see being sponsored or proffered by members of Congress and senators, including my Senator Maggie Hassan, um, are, are, you know, they may be included in the reconciliation package. They have to be included in a specific way. Um, but to tell you the truth, it's all small bore stuff. Uh, it, 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 and and that's, that, that is the sad truth. Uh, what we what we learned from COVID is uh, there isn't a debate between public health or the economy. Public health is the economy, and what we what we need to understand and share with people is it's not climate action or the economy. Climate change is the economy, uh, and as Rabbi uh, Martin said. You know, I'm paraphrasing, but it's more than CO2. It's more than carbon reductions. These are cultural shifts that we're going to need to make. Our culture is, is resting on 
a fossil fuel foundation. And there's got to be some shifts and we have to embrace that and be glad that we can do it because we have the potential to do so. So I would encourage, I think the moment that you have right now in August, when with your senator's home is to say, you've got to support, um, you know, what you've done with the bipartisan infrastructure package is terrific, but it's not to the level of the American jobs plan, which is where we need to be. And <clears throat> next week, um, two things will happen. There'll be a vote on infrastructure and there will be a vote on the budget resolution. The budget resolution will simply be the top line amounts that will, will be given to the committees. They will say, Environment and Public Works Committee, you'll get X billion dollars. Environment and Natural Resources Committee, Energy and Natural Resources Committee, you'll get X billion dollars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They'll vote on that top line and go home. That's the best, that's the best case scenario. In September, the House will take up the, the um, bipartisan infrastructure bill um, and begin debate. And in September, the Senate will take up the reconciliation package and begin debate. I suspect there's no questions because we're so busy taking notes as I was, um, because every word that you're saying is so full of really wonderful information. I'd like to take one more question if we have one more question and then we need to move on. I'd, uh, I'd be interested in, in speaking. Uh, I'm Art Gershkoff um, from um, uh, just outside of Philadelphia, work with Phyllis to try to uh, send letters to our uh, senators and, uh, and Congress uh, representatives. <clears throat> um, but um, I'd be interested in, in uh, I, I, first of all, I, it's a wonderful talk that you gave, um, uh, Roger, and, but I'd like your response. How do you approach um, um, in, our, in, our, in Pennsylvania, there's uh, uh, the Republicans uh, have majorities in both both House and Senate, um, and um, they are uh, really quite against uh, active participation. Um, for instance, in a, uh, a regional greenhouse gas initiative, which involves uh, what a dozen states now, um, and um, <clears throat> um, they just seem uh, so uh, against. Um, embracing um, any step towards participation in, uh, in, in trying to reduce uh, dependence on oil and gas. Uh, uh, I think uh, many of them uh, are, are from uh, areas of the state that are, that, uh, are heavily involved in, in uh, fossil fuel, um, you know, fracking, whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, how does one of, approach someone who seems to be so diametrically opposed to um, what, um, you know, what we seek. I, I think I, I absolutely agree with you in terms of, of um, trying to find something to compliment on, compliment them on. Um, and for that, I'll have to do some research. But um, do you have other suggestions? No. <clears throat> Well, uh, when you are you speaking about approaching the state legislators? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I was under the impression that Pennsylvania was moving forward or progressing towards uh, uh, adopt uh, joining the regional greenhouse gas initiative. There, there's there's a bill uh, in 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 the Senate now, <clears throat> um, or uh, Senate Bill One Nineteen that basically says that um, the state cannot adopt any carbon tax um, uh, unless it is approved by the legislature. So as long as they are in the majority, that will never happen. 
SB 119 did pass, <coughs> it's now in the House. And, and it's it, the House is adjourned until September, but the, the governor really wants to make it happen. It's the, it's the legislators that they're doing everything in their power not to. But I think Art's point is another one that's similar to how, what do we say to our Republican Senator? We have to search for ways to thank him for what he's done also, and not just tell him that he's not, you know, it's easier to, to thank Casey because Casey's come out on things, but we really need to be forming a relationship with Toomey also. Well, my gosh, um, uh, I'm, I hope I didn't give the impression, but I don't think you necessarily have to thank the senator on, uh, uh, for doing something on an issue central to cl climate or carbon. Oh. You know, there could be uh, issues that you have in common that have to do mm. with education, uh, child welfare, housing, um, um, things like that. Absolutely. I mean, let's let's look broadly. And, and, and you can easily pivot, you know, if you care so much about, uh, now I'm just riffing here, but if you care so much about uh, childhood education or the welfare of children, um, and it's clearly you demonstrate that in your votes and your leadership, can I talk to you about that, their future under um, a mm -hmm. 2.5 degree world? Mm -hmm. That's um, fabulous advice. I did not know that, thank you. Sure. You know, one of the things you can do, in, um, in, if any of you tweet, is to use, use hashtags that will attract other so these surprise partners um, sort of thing. Um, I'm reading Sydney's comment here. Uh, yeah, the rest of the state we, where we have no soy not being constituents of theirs. Absolutely right on target. And that's where we need to use um, our friends and family plan from Verizon or whoever that is, but friends and family and relationships. Uh, I've always considered Pennsylvania to be three states. It's so big. And uh, um, I thought that, uh, yes, Toomey is a lame duck. And um, it, lame ducks can, you know, lame ducks. Nevertheless, have a legacy, mm -hmm. and there's uh, there's still time. I think to to include in Toomey's legacy something on this issue, but I certainly would um, look for again do that research. Of what they care about. Um, I was getting weekly emails from Senator Merkley uh, from. Uh, the Pacific Northwest, because I commented on his Christmas card and I said, oh, I had an Airedale too when I was a boy. He had a, an Airedale in his Christmas card. And that's all it took to develop a relationship was a common bond but on a, on a, on a, a, a particular dog. Um, does anyone have a suggestion on what Toomey care, does care about? How would one go about answering that question. Does anyone have any thoughts? Yeah, you know, he cares about the military and uh, I think has, has been, you know, done some, some positive things to be, that benefit uh, the military. Um, he cares about the military. I don't know if, if, he, if so in that regard, um, there are, um, Seth, help me out, or, or Phyllis, you may know, or, or Rabbi Martin, you may know, there is a security-related, national security-related organization on climate. And they have a very good story to tell, using NCOs and officers who are, were in Iraq, and talking about how much resource went into simply protecting their fossil fuel supply line between the port and, um, uh, and the front lines. Mm -hmm. uh, and how much the military has done and how much the military talks about in their quadrennial um, readiness report 
how much they talk about climate as a threat multiplier. I do know it's certainly been a, a, con a constant topic in many of the fields that I see um, where the military recognizes that part of their problem is trying to defend these supply lines in remote parts of the world where we have no other real interest except those. And if we were to become more self-sufficient and by the same token, more environmentally secure, our, the military bases would not have the problems they had. Many of them are located in vulnerable areas. The issue of, um, of energy, used reliance on potentially disruptable energy supplies like pipelines and so on. I, I do know the military, for, for what I've read, the military is very concerned about those aspects. I yeah. hate to be the party pooper here. Um, this is a phenomenally wonderful discussion, but we are close to the hour that we're supposed to have. And I want to make sure we also <clears throat> cover taking the next step, and that's advocacy. And I want people to be aware of how we can make it really easy for you to be an advocate by writing letters. Um, and I have posted this, and I will put it in the chat also, that the Jewish Earth Alliance every single month comes out with this topic that they want you to talk about. This month, it's exactly what Roger was talking about, no compromise on climate. We don't even have a down payment yet. We need to really fund the things that we need to do to make a difference. They talk about background, why now? Although they give the Jewish perspective, it's really a humanistic, religious, spiritual type of perspective that anybody could adapt. Key messages, talking points, how to learn more, more resources. And then there's a sample letter. And they make it really, really simple to write that letter um, because they have a template. Basically, the template is to thank the senator or representative for what they've done. And thank you, Roger, for opening up that, that window for me so I can thank to me for the good votes that he's done that have nothing to do with environment, because I was always scratching my head and reading his website for anything about the environment. And then really saying that you are part of the majority of Americans that really want to see this happen. Um, and then you want to talk about something from your own perspective, something that affects you, something that really is your story. And then um, the um, representatives and the senators are religious people themselves, and they listen to fellow religious people. So put in, if you can, as a Christian, as a Buddhist, as a Muslim, I believe such and such. And then um, something on the climate change at the end can be this exact thing. I urge you not to compromise on climate. And that's your letter. Um, you're just going to change the top to what you're thanking them for. Luckily, Casey, you can thank him for being a leader on the climate uh, conservation core because he really is coming out in favor of that. If your representative is like mine, Madeline Dean, you know, I asked her in a meeting with her if she would be one of our 10 leaders in the, in the house to be um, on climate. And her answer to me was, I hope you would consider me already to be that way. So we can hold her feet to the fire and we can say to her, we're expecting more leadership from you. We're expecting you to be doing that. And that's your leader, uh, your letter rather. Um, it's very easy to do it. Email them all to me as attachments, three separate attachments, one to each, um, one to Senator Toomey, one to Casey, and one to your representative. And the Jewish Earth Alliance puts them all together, sends a cover letter that Ed, who was on the call earlier, puts together and writes the cover letter. And then the cover letter will say, here are 25 letters. I would love to see that. 25 letters from your constituents across the state who believe in climate. And that really has a powerful impact. So I would um, also, I promised somebody that I would make a, 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 a call about another action statement that people can do. And that's if you've been following anything with Dianu, which is an, an, a really interesting organization of um, people who are really acting. They're calling for people in September to appear in front of Casey's office and blow the shofar. The shofar is the what we use in the high holidays. It's a ram's horn. It's a very loud, shrill thing. And when you put many, many people together to make to blow a shofar, it's it's heard. 
and um, it can be a very powerful action. So we're going to try to organize something in September in front of Casey's office in Philadelphia. If we can do it in front of Pittsburgh, that would be great. Erie, wherever he has an office, but that would be an absolutely wonderful thing to do. So um, I know we are at the hour where we were supposed to be. I will and be happy to stay on the line. Answer before questions. you do, though, um, Amani, might I suggest that you get a screenshot of everyone's faces as a, um, a way to um, sort of memorialize this and use it in the future? Yes, absolutely. Um, you have to go to gallery okay. view, I think. Okay. And if you don't want your picture, to, but I, I hope you all do add your faces here. And I wish we could each have our own sign. This is climate action now. I'm sorry, how do you take a picture? I feel like I'm I, not I think you just, you just hit print screen. Oh, okay. I thought it was the way I'm Zoom. If you do it. Okay, it's done. Sorry. Great, everyone smile. <laughs> Great. Okay. Got it. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. I would be happy to stay on. I don't know about Roger and, and Rabbi Nathan. I won't speak for them. We'll see whether they stay on or not to answer hey. questions, to engage in more dialogue. Um, and certainly I'd be happy to help you write your story and write your first letter. Your first letter is your toughest letter. After you've written that letter, they're much easier after that, especially with um, computers that we can cut and paste. And uh, it's that, and, and we asked uh, members of Congress too at one point, um, and their staff, what is it about these, um, these uh, the, the information that there's on their website, if you want to contact them, you, you put your name and address, <clears throat> you put your message in a, in a box and send it along. They said, everyone reads those. Everyone reads those. Um, the history of email and Congress, um, Back in 1996, 97, members of Congress were getting 30, 40 emails a week. <clears throat> we were able to take care of that. Uh, the exponential rise in emails to members of Congress happened uh, because of President Clinton's transgressions. That's how the that's that's the history of the exponential rise and management problems Congress had in dealing with emails from constituents. It started then um, and they've managed to create this interface now uh, that they use and, and, they, and staff do read those emails. I know I get very long detailed letters from Casey and to me very detailed letters from to me he he takes one word of what i'm talking about and then he goes on a different tangent but i am quite sure he has some aid being very annoyed at me because i write to him so often i call him so often and i and i send so many emails he probably gets that he opens that email and goes oh phyllis blumberg again 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 but he knows me he knows my name <laughs> Oftentimes, um, getting to know a staff member is mm -hmm. is uh, really um, it can be it can can move mountains. And sharing with that staff member or asking them, "Hey, what what elements of this issue are you concerned about?" Asking them questions. Uh, what elements of this issue do you need more information? Um, do you need any information in your district about businesses that are using clean energy? Um, would you like to uh, consider doing an event to uh, celebrate this, uh, this technology? That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But you're right, holding their feet to the fire. I think it was... Uh, 
is is going to be important, particularly here in this. We, we, we can't let up on reconciliation. And then we can't let up after it's passed. What, what are you most excited about with the reconciliation bill, Roger? From a climate um, perspective. From a climate perspective, um, yeah. I, I am uh, I am anticipating that a <clears throat> that utilities around the country would, and this includes the Edison Electric Institute. I perhaps, uh, but I look for th I th I look been doing behavioral public relations for many many years, and. Communications is simply a way station to getting the behaviors we need from target audience. And the behaviors are, we want people to do something, stop doing something, or continue doing something, or do nothing. And I'd like to see the Edison Electric Institute do nothing on a, on a clean energy standard, because in the reconciliation bill, and I'm not an expert, but in a reconciliation bill, if a clean energy standard were in there, we would have to use federal funds to pay utilities. So I'm excited about the possibility of a clean energy standard. Um, Pennsylvania, Ohio, sorry, but I'm a downwinder state and uh, the Ohio River Valley is a source of um, some of that pollution, that air pollution. I don't know about you, but I was bird watching last, oh, what's my date here? On the 8th, I believe it was the 18th. I'll have to go on my records. But in the morning, there was this orange haze, and that was haze from the wildflowers that was. Did any of you witness that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a clean I energy saw. standard would make Ohio have a renewable energy standard, just as Maine is leading, New Hampshire is a laggard. Um, having a universal standard would be terrific. So I'd like to ask a question. Um, it sounds somewhat skeptical, but I, it starts with several years ago, I wrote to one of the Republican leaders in Congress and it was a long and polite letter, but it was also asking, expressing my opinion. And I sort of thought I'd get an acknowledgement that I'd sent a letter. I, I didn't know that he would personally read it, but all I really got was a uh, hundred follow-up um, blurbs from him over the next five years, uh, trying to persuade, you know, inform me about his positions. And I don't know if anyone ever, other than taking my email address, I wasn't sure anybody ever read it. And um, it discouraged me somewhat. And so, I mean, like, I, I, I'm a good letter writer. Um, I saw that template you put up, Phyllis. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of my time writing good letters if they're really just counted. Um, as opposed to actually somebody reading them. And, and one of the things I thought kind of a follow-up is, well, are postcards just as good because they're easy to count? Um, um, can, may I respond to that, Phyllis? Of course. Uh, I was assigned by Secretary Babbitt to the Council on Environmental Quality uh, a number of years ago to work on a particular issue. And I do remember, like it was yesterday, the Sierra Club coming with several cartons of postcards. That makes a great deal of work for staff. Um, but let me let me suggest this to you, Harris, or Mr. Stern. Harris, hi. Um, um, I'd share your opinion in your local paper. Okay. And, and, and say exactly what you said just there. You know, you're saying what? Well, I, that you're a, you know, you enjoy, you're, you're a good letter writer, you're a conscientious letter writer. Uh, I never got a response. I'm wondering if they're reading what I write or they just count. Mm. You know, opening up 
that hood um, could very well, I mean, staff members have to read the papers in their district. That's their job. And so, and turning your attention to, to that, you know, to, you know, um, moving within the context of public debate into your paper of record, your weekly newspaper, um, could be another strategy. Good at, has anyone else had this problem? Has anyone experienced what I've experienced in writing a letter to my member of Congress and not getting a response? I think they're not only, they're, they're counted if they're mass produced. So when you sign a petition, then they're counting them to see how many people sign the petition. And it could be like 10,000 or whatever, these petitions. But when it's an individual letter, I do believe the staffers at least glance at them. And if there's something in that letter that they like, they might remember it. But if you're pressed for time, I would say make it a really simple letter. Um, then it would be part of the count. But if you have a personal story to tell, or if you have something that really is your passion, or something that in this issue makes so much sense for you to say it. And then say it again. And, and say again. it again. And say it again <laughs> in a letter to the editor. And again and again. And you could uh, take what you've written, take a screenshot of it with your phone, and post it to Twitter. Mm. Don't do Twitter. <laughs> um, and I, I will say I did write letters to my local state representatives. Oh, and maybe the congressional ones too. And I did get responses to those. So I, it may be that the more local you get, the more likely it is that it's going to be seen and read. But at least that matches my experience somewhat. Harris, where do you live? Bella Kenwood. Oh, we're neighbors. <laughs> Um, I have very, I have no success getting letters to the editor published. I hope you're more successful than I am. Well, I haven't tried that. I so. know that um, small towns have a much easier time getting papers, uh, getting letters uh, published, and the Philadelphia Inquirer must get a huge volume of them. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> feel free to download the uh, letter to the editor uh, primer that I posted in the chat. Yeah, thank you. Timing is everything. Gatekeepers, their job is to sell newspapers. And if you had, and I, and I tend to think that with members returning to Pennsylvania for August, with the bipartisan deal in the rearview mirror and the possibility of reconciliation ahead, a perfect time, and I think editors would welcome composed, brief, 150 words, 200 word letters to talk about this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I will leave you to your pen and pe pencil, <laughs> paper. Or keyboard. <laughs> Handwritten letters really have an impact too. And if you have children who are interested in this, children's pictures, children's little two word sentences or so really have a huge impact. Elected officials, if a whole classroom sends them um, yeah. poems and stories and pictures, they often put that up in their office. And coerce your family and friends. Yep. Uh, you know, invite them to your home. Uh, share the stories. Compare notes. Have you thought about this issue? Mm -hmm. Here's what it means. 
would we would anyone regret if we had cleaner air? Mm -hmm. uh, if we we're energy independent, uh, there are climate climate benefits to clean air. So, uh, use your imagination. Use some of your time to invite your families and friends to celebrate in this moment in time. And uh, I say, good good luck and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, it was an honor to uh, spend some time with all of you. Uh, Phyllis, no doubt, I hope you bring uh, UCS back into the fold and we can uh, do damage together with uh, uh, the Jewish Earth Alliance, the Interfaith Power and Light, and LCV. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks, much. All. Um, before we go, uh, Roger mentioned that he's enthusiastic that the clean energy standard might actually pass and it might be something that could be have an impact. And that's tentatively our topic of conversation for the September meeting is the clean energy standard. Great. And please uh, pull from Rachel Cletus's blog that I shared with you in your letter writing. Mm -hmm. By all means, uh, uh, repurpose. Uh, I'll protect you from plagiarism. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This was a fabulous presentation. Thanks a lot. You bet. Bye -bye. Thank you, Roger. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.